One, we are live. Boa tarde, pessoal. Tudo bem, então? A gente vai começar uh, a nossa transmissão com a última... A última live, então, a nossa transmissão, que vai ser com o professor Christian Chan, da University of Massachusetts, uh, em Boston. Então, sejam todos muito bem-vindos. Ok, good afternoon, everybody. So, here we are for a Bradley Tech live series. This is the last one for uh, 2020. And it's real my pleasure to have here uh, Dr. Christian Chan from the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And he is an associate professor of applied linguistics uh, in the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Massachusetts um, in Boston and the author of two books, Power and Meaning Making in an EAP Classroom published by Multilingual Matters in 2015, and the Discourses of Capitalism, Everyday Economists and the Production of Common Sense, published by Rutledge in 2017. He's currently working on his next book for Rutledge, addressing co-constructed identities and spaces, and is editing the volume Applied Linguistics and Politics for Bloomsbury, Today, Dr. Chan will give us a talk on A World Without Capitalism, Discourses, Identities, and Spaces. Please, Dr. Chan. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's quite an honor to be able to present on your platform here. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. So the first question I would ask is uh, can we imagine a world without the socio-economic systemically based society that has been called for at least the past 200 years capitalism? Um, a society that is no longer co-created, permeated, and indeed invaded by the political, economic, cultural, ideological, linguistic, and discursive domains enabling to construct and support and perpetuate a capitalist run and dominated economy and culture. So but perhaps by even asking this question, uh, can a world exist without capitalism? Um, it, we may inadvertently uh, suggest that there is only quote unquote one world uh, and uh, in doing so um, enable abject resignation and frustration among those of us who yearn for a life beyond and free of capitalism. Now, why bother asking these questions? Well, um, if you do believe in science, I hope, um, uh, over 97% of scientists have estimated that we have less than 12 years to limit catastrophic climate change. Um, As of July of last year, that estimation has been revised to now less than 19 months. So one of the questions I would ask is, well, uh, is it fair to perhaps uh, blame the Fortune 500 companies uh, for destroying the environmental ecosystem of our planet? Um, going along with the neoliberal discourses that have been in social circulation for the past 20 years, Uh, the onus would be on the individual, ourselves, in terms of assuming more, quote unquote, personal responsibility in saving the planet by recycling more, uh, bringing our um, ceramic uh, coffee mugs instead of using the plastic or paper ones um, um, given to us by the chain uh, shops. Um, and Also, uh, um, uh, one trend has been to become a vegan, to give up eating uh, red meat, which is contributing to climate change um, disasters. However, um, according to Riley, published in 2017, only 100 corporations, including the ones well-known, of course, such as uh, 
British Petroleum, Chevron, ExxonMobil, and Shell are responsible for over 70% of the global emissions. I think would, I would argue that another reason to ask if a world can exist without capitalism in our lifetime is to pose uh, these questions to our family members, our friends, our neighbors, coworkers, and the strangers on the street is question, is this the best we could actually do? Now, um, drawing on the statistics in the context of the United States, the Economic Policy Institute reported that from 1978 to 2018, the CEO, the Chief Executive or, um, Officer of a Corporation, the CEO composition, compensation grew by over 1,000%, okay, far outstripping the Standard & Poor stock market growth of 706% and the wage growth of very high earners. In contrast, the wages for the typical workers grew by just 11.9%. Uh, and I think this illustrates what that German philosopher Karl Marx wrote in 19, I'm sorry, 1859, there must be something rotten in the very core of the social system which increases its wealth without diminishing its misery. So it's again in the context of the US, the surveys in the US showing that the majority of people under the age of 30 um, have uh, rejected capitalism and are in favor of uh, democratic um, socialism in which uh, these corporations are held not only held accountable, but that we have a greater say in, in our not only running these corporations as workers, but in, in terms of also running our societies in, in, in the interest of a true democracy, for the aims of a true democracy, okay? So one of the questions I would ask uh, uh, that's been driving my research is how can we not only envision, but also enact a world without capitalism? So are there glimpses of the future already present in our everyday lives, discourses, imaginaries, and practices? And I address these questions in, in, um, in providing examples in both hindering and enabling these co-constructions of a world beyond capitalism. And so this builds on my previous work, um, the book that was published in 2017, Discourses of Capitalism, in terms of how, again, the uh, people take up the discourses of capitalism uh, and also the material lived realities that we see around us in our linguistic landscapes. Um, and so this has been part of my uh, ongoing ethnographic exploration for the past several years. One of the things I would I would mention right off the top would be uh, one trend in academia, uh, particularly within applied linguistics has been the frequent use of the word neoliberalism uh, by many scholars, including myself before. Um, however, I would argue that uh, by using the term neoliberalism rather than capitalism, it obscures a number of factors, one of which is that um, capitalism itself, uh, um, uh, following on Voloshinov's idea of the multi-accentuated word has a multiplicity of meanings in that, um, of course, um, it's been articulated through various ideological frames uh, leading to and co-constructing many different understandings amongst many different people about what capitalism actually is. And that is part of the hegemony of capitalism in terms of how uh, these multiplicities of meanings drive it forward. So one example, of course, is this idea of capitalism is the notion of freedom, right? That is that, oh, unlike the uh, uh, slave era you know, or and or the feudal era, uh, capitalism is that, you know, you're free to sell your labor. You know, you if you don't like your job, fine, you can quit it. You can quit the job and find another job, okay? Or if you have enough money, if you borrow the money from the bank, you can set up your own business, okay? Um, now, in this frame, uh, capitalism does seem to offer freedom uh, in terms of uh, regarding, uh, uh, in comparison with the slavery period in which the enslaved people uh, had no choice. Uh, but, uh, well, in fact, they did have agency in terms of uh, literally quitting their jobs by escaping, by running away, right? But then, of course, the, the, the law was trying to hunt them down. Um, 
Whereas in capitalism, this idea of freedom, although also extends to the employer who has the ability to fire you, the worker, at a moment's notice without really any reason whatsoever and without any democratic say whatsoever from amongst the rest of the fellow uh, co-workers, okay? And so this would appear to contradict the notion of freedom in terms of one person uh, or a, a small group of people deciding on the rules, the compensations, the wages, the time off, and so forth for the rest of the workforce, okay? And indeed, uh, Frederick Ingalls in 1845 um, wrote that, uh, quote, the worker is in law and in fact the slave of the bourgeoisie, which can decree his life or death. It offers him the means of living, but only for an equivalent for his work, um, end of quote. And then in doing so, the capitalist, quote, even lets him have the appearance of acting from a free choice of making a contract with free unconstrained consent as a responsible agent who has attained his majority, end of quote. So we can see here that discourse has been ongoing in the past uh, 180 years or so since Ingalls wrote that in terms of that. And so this builds into my argument of why I um, have been using the term capitalism over neoliberalism and I would encourage other academics and uh, scholars um, uh, researchers uh, to do so, because part of the argument I would say would be heightening the aware awareness of actually what is neoliberalism, which is a phase in capitalism in which in the past 40 years, as we know, with the rise of Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in the United States, started to dismantle the social welfare state that was started uh, in the aftermath or during the Great Depression in the US that was a global depression, okay? And by dismantling the social welfare state that is cutting back uh, uh, public tax money for education, uh, you know, funding unemployment, um, social security and so forth and privatizing publicly funded schools uh, which has now been called charter schools, and again, in the context of the U.S., the idea of if we get rid of neoliberalism, somehow our society will be better by shifting to a Keynes or state-managed or um, Keynesian form of capitalism in which, again, those in power in the government are the ones deciding to reallocate our public tax money. However, the social relations at the workplace will still be the same. So hence, this idea around neoliberalism uh, as a substitute word for capitalism is one that I would argue against using because, again, it leads to, um, I would say, perhaps some sort of confusions at time, but more importantly, uh, an obscuring of the dynamics of the actual systems in place, uh, whether it is, again, the neoliberal phase of the government or more of the Keynesian social welfare managed one. One of the theoretical, um, I think, important uh, frameworks uh, that I've uh, been in, uh, employing is drawing on the French philosopher Henri Lefebvre in his notion of the everyday. Um, and that is to address the ways in which we all go through our daily lives. Now, of course, you know, with the ongoing viral pandemic in the past year that has been, I would say, has I would think many would agree, um, dramatically illustrated in terms of how our daily lives have been turned upside down um, in, in ways that we would never have anticipated. Uh, but I think it also calls into uh, question, uh, what is our meaning of our daily lives? And this idea of, okay, if we are so-called, quote unquote, fortunate to have a job, and that is one of the, uh, another uh, prominent discourses in a capitalist society that somehow we are supposed to be grateful that we have a job uh, rather than, than having an envisioning society, a society where everyone is able to have a job, everyone is able to be employed, right? Uh, and so that the fact that we, if we have a job, we're almost feeling the need to say, thank you, thank you, thank you, master. Okay. So the idea of that, if we have this job, we wake up every morning, Right, we put on our work clothes, we go out and we go to our job, we come back home and it repeats 
five, six days, for some of us, seven days a week, right? As we know, some workers work round the clock seven days a week. Um, and it's this idea of the everyday that Lefebvre was trying to um, analyze, uh, which has been rooted in the concepts uh, that were developed again by Karl Marx in his notion of both alienation and estrangement. Now, uh, Karl Marx used two different uh, German words uh, for those terms. However, in, in the context of the US, the English translations of those two German words were just used was just alienations and they were applied to both. But actually there's a, there was a differentiation between alienation and the other word, the English word estrangement, drawing on the two German words that Marx uh, used. One of which is that alienation is how, what he called how we as workers are become alienated from the products that we make. So for example, if we're, if we're working in a, in a car manufacturing factory, we, you know, we and the fellow coworkers, we, we build the, we build the automobile, uh, and once we build it, well, you know, it's never ours to begin with, right? Unlike back in the day, perhaps a craftsperson, when craftspeople would build things, that was what theirs to sell or, and or to keep, right? Uh, whereas when car workers and any other workers, when they're building these commodities, those commodities never belong to them from the get-go. So that's what uh, Marx meant by alienation. There's also, though, uh, another important term, estrangement, which has not been frequently used in the English language. And estrangement was building on that concept of alienation, but estrangement in terms of our social relations, so that we are literally estranged from one another due to the economic and social relations that have been co-constructed through capitalism, in which we, you know, well, part of what Part of it is that the, of course, the competitive culture that we have in terms of like, oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'll get that job over you, and I got the job and you don't, so you're a loser. Or they got the job and I didn't, I'm a loser. Okay, and so this, this is just one of the many aspects of an estrangement in which we feel estranged from one another, our humanity, and what I'm going to be talking about in a bit is that. Uh, uh, along the social domains of not only class, but uh, importantly as well, uh, gender and race have played into our becoming estranged from one another. And not to sound conspiratorial, but I don't think it's coincidental that it is part of the divide and rule in keeping many of us who are exploited and oppressed from working together in solidarity. So this idea, um, going back to the idea of the everyday of Lefebvre, he uh, categorized it into three domains, one of which I was mentioning before, the, the daily life. And then what he called uh, uh, the everydayness, uh, which is the kind of the, uh, again, the banality of our everyday in terms of like every day maybe seems to feel the same, okay? And, and then the concept of the everyday. In other words, why, how of this uh, idea of the everyday as what he called the object of a programming. In other words, how can he um, uh, reconceptualize what it actually means for our lives to have a fulfilling life, okay? So one of the fundamental aspects of capitalism is the economic and social relations at the workplace. So again, going back to this idea of how uh, we at the workplace do not have a say. I mean, we can say something about, oh, you know, could I get a pay raise or I need some time off, uh, but we're not the ones who are deciding this. Again, it is only uh, uh, one person usually or a small group of people deciding for many others. and. Interestingly, the dynamics of that, of course, there have been this idea of a class relation. So that was what, what Karl Marx and many others have meant by the class relations in terms of the working class, literally the people who are working but who are not in power. However, the discourse and the understanding of what the working class is uh, over its trajectory in the past 170 years or so has come, at least in the context of the U.S. Um, and countries like England, and uh, I would say many other countries as well, 
the uh, has come to signify this idea of working class as being, and I'm putting it in scare quotes, you know, low level wage persons or people who did not go to university, uh, people, uh, the so-called manual labor working with their hands um, as if academics don't work with their hands. Uh, we do work with our hands. We're, you know, working all the day with our hands, right? Uh, but are we literally building things? No. So that is a difference, but we are also working with our hands. Um, and so that example of academics would never be seen in some academics, not all, but some academics would also never see themselves as working class because, oh, I have a university education. Oh, and, um, you know, I, I wear a jacket to work and, uh, and so forth. Or I have a nice office. But again, you know, going back to this idea of the uh, the actual relations, uh, what your position is in the relation in the um, in the social relations of production. Um, if you are actually not owning and running and profiting from the company, uh, then you are working class. And so the emergence of this term middle class, again, was a tool in in some ways to divide the workers who some workers who might have been paid a little bit higher or some workers who, are, who might have had more education than others to dismiss other workers that they started to see as somehow inferior to them. And I think this is important because one of these ideas of how uh, class as a, uh, should not be viewed as a thing, as in the category, but rather, again, the social relational process that is uh, shaped by our uh, situational uh, workplace context. Um, and this is going to be illustrated in one of the participant uh, interviews that I'm going to present in a, in a, in a bit. Um, I think also in terms of uh, the field of applied linguistics, specifically social linguistics, I, I, I argued in my article um, in the Journal of Social Linguistics last year that the this alternative class analytic paradigm is going beyond uh, going beyond speech and of course going beyond um, uh, 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 appearance as well uh, in terms of how class processes and performativities would um, as Buchholz and Hall 2005 wrote quote emerges and circulates in local discourse context of interaction, end of quote, in particular encounters. In other words, how some of these class identities might shift uh, depending on who is interacting with whom, okay? Um, and so again, this idea of how we might be uh, participating in multiple class uh, processes at a single moment and over time. Um, all right, the, I want to address here a bit the role of uh, race in capitalism. Um, the uh, uh, idea of uh, whiteness um, was formulated by the um, scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote in his landmark book, uh, Black Reconstruction in America, where he coined the term, the psychological and public wages of whiteness in which he examined how and why the white working class uh, during the 1800s uh, started to feel superior to the enslaved people who descended from Africa um, and, who, and some of whom were directly from Africa, and how and why that these white working class people started to distance themselves from the enslaved people. Because this is uh, this may uh, some of you may not know this, but in 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 the year 1676 in Virginia was called Bacon's Rebellion, in which a group of indentured uh, white servants, uh, immigrants from Europe, of course, and then the enslaved people from Africa, formed a united front against the plantation owners and they revolted, okay? Um, and so after this revolt, uh, the ruling elite, as it were, saw the dangers of the solidarity movements amongst all workers and started to contribute toward the perpetuation and co-construction of 
racialized categories of human beings. Okay? Um, I went quote, I'm going to quote this passage uh, from Studs Terkel um, in his book uh, entitled Race, How Blacks and Whites Think and Feel About the American Obsession, in which he saliently illustrated the psychological ways of whiteness with the following two references. So this is a quote. Lillian Smith, in her short story, Two Men in a Bargain, writes of the rich white who persuaded the poor white to work for 50 cents an hour. And when the poor white complained, um, the rich white said, I can get uh, the N word for two bits an hour. You're better than him, ain't you? We're the same color, ain't we? Martin Luther King was more succinct in his 1965 Montgomery speech. The poor white was fed Jim Crow instead of bread. And so, I think this is important in terms of how the ways in which uh, white working class, not all, but some, voted for, uh, have voted against their interests, and not just in the recent, uh, the past two elections, but over decades, why and how some poor white workers have voted against their interests. So here is the um, first interview. <clears throat> This participant uh, self-identifies as a black American uh, and he grew up in a um, working class community in Detroit uh, and now is working in uh, Los Angeles. And as you can see from this, this is where he addresses um, some of the pitfalls of what has become a neoliberalized identity politics and that is an emphasis on one particular uh, social identity to the exclusion of how other identities and our social roles overdetermine these in various contexts. So he continues. Okay, the, the next uh, participant I would like to share uh, is this. He um, is a person who um, has spent his uh, whole life in the Boston area. And so here's my question. So for those of you who may not know, the reference um, in the last line here when he mentions busing, uh, this was the attempt by the state governments um, in several uh, regions in the United States, uh, starting with New York uh, and then also uh, in Boston, in which um, to try to foster more equitable, equitable access to public school education, uh, the state would start busing uh, poor black students into white neighborhoods. However, in terms of Bo uh, what has happened here in Boston, the pattern was that was predominantly when they bust the, the poor black students into white neighborhoods, the white neighborhoods themselves were poor. And so as far as I know, very few were actually shipped into wealthy white neighborhoods. 
And so this is this is what he's referencing to, uh, because uh, as you can see, where he talks about Charlestown, the neighborhood he grew up in, was very working class back in the day. Uh, and when the these uh, students were being bussed into it, there was this resentment amongst uh, some, not all, but some of the white students because of the feeling of the perception of they had very few resources, as it were, and now um, more people were coming in who were not living in the neighborhood, so there was that resentment. And this is a, 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 a racial, racial dynamic, obviously, involved in which you're poor, pitting, in, in many ways, uh, poor black people with poor white people, and they're, and they're literally fighting over the crumbs, right? Okay. Um, and so when I continue, I say, well, <clears throat> All right. Well, you know, it's interesting because, again, you know, this idea that, um, as uh, David Rodiger wrote um, uh, in his book, The Wages of Whiteness, in which he drew upon the, the seminal work of W.E.B. Du Bois, who I quoted before, uh, his, his, what he wrote, quote, the idea that the pleasures of whiteness could function as a, quote, unquote, wage for white workers, um, helped to foster the acceptance of many white workers of their class position by fashioning identities as not slaves and as not blacks. Uh, and so he writes at crucial historical moments, the white working class has not only been manipulated into racism, but it comes to think of itself and its interests as white rather than as workers, right? And I think part, in part, the, partici the participant two's narrative uh, offers a kind of a glimpse into how the inter-animating processes of race and class produce a particular racialized identity that we're proud of one's class background and perhaps imp the implication might be in terms of one's race as well uh, of how the seeming lack of a solidarity with fellow uh, uh, st students from similar economic backgrounds. Now, going circling back to the idea that I was talking about in terms of you know, going beyond the uh, static category of, of classes um, in terms of how it, or centralizing notions of what middle class is, uh, this interview uh, is with a participant who is a public school teacher in Southern California. So I ask the person this question and they respond. Now, just based on what this person says just here, um, uh, as you can see, the person self-identifies as middle class and they uh, cite examples such as, you know, owning a house, owning a car and so forth, uh, which has been uh, normatively assigned this um, um, attributes of a middle class. However, I go on to ask how they describe their daily life. And this is what they said. They continue. <clears throat> so it's interesting, though this teacher places themselves in a uh, middle class category, 
right? Um, just from the account of their daily lived experiences, um, I would argue that they don't conform to the usual and or dominant representations of what constitutes middle class in the United States. Um, because as you can see, the person's working literally nonstop, okay? Um, and so this idea of uh, this nonstop work going well over the 40 hour work week, which is normally associated with uh, middle class professionals, I think calls into question this uh, categorical grouping of middle class, so-called middle class based on income uh, level or property ownership and certain consumer goods. And I think this contradiction um, between the middle class and construct of supposed social positions and the class processes of selling and depending on one's nonstop labor to survive is the critical overlap that Raymond Williams argued in terms of uh, the uh, this idea of middle class, how it devolved during Victorian era in England, okay? Um, and so clearly um, the, the teacher's uh, self-narrative, the class is not one of exclusively one of belonging, but rather uh, one of becoming in the ongoing battle with the neoliberalizing transformation of public schools with increased class sizes and teaching loads. Uh, in another part of the interview, uh, the, the teacher uh, uh, shares that they have uh, well over 40 students in each of their classes. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to get to this uh, discourses of space. Um, and this, I think, one of the questions I would ask is when, you know, when we walk down the street, uh, what do we actually see? So uh, for those of us who live in urban neighborhoods, um, and of course it's been interesting with the last 20 years or so where um, I'm sure everyone's had this experience, maybe bumping into someone who was looking at their cell phone, their mobile phone and not looking where they're going. Um, but it's interesting. Interesting where people know, or some people, not all, but some people are glued to their screen, their digital device screen, right? And not actually being, maybe looking around as much. I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out a kind of a, a research survey of actually that. But I'm going back to this idea of when you do notice things on the street, what do you notice? Okay. And so what do you actually, uh, how do you actually make sense of what you see on these streets in terms of how urban spaces have changed, how urban spaces have, um, have been uh, forms of capital, right? In, uh, of course, uh, with gentrification that is happening uh, all the time uh, and increasingly so, okay? And this idea of how urbanized spatial relations uh, are transformed into and enact social relations, right? In which, you know, for example, you know, you go, you, if you're uh, 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 from a certain class, you know, you know if, if, you, if, if, if you're going into a very well-off neighborhood, do you feel comfortable walking around the well-off well neighborhood? Would you ever go into a store like, um, I don't know, like Tiffany's or some store that sells like, you know, it's very expensive jewelry. Would you ever go in there just to window shop, so to speak, right? Or, or do you avoid that parts of town because you know that you would just, you know, you, you feel that you wouldn't belong there, okay? Now, also with that would be in terms of how uh, language uh, is displayed on these, on these uh, signs in these neighborhoods in which it in indexes particular identities of our neighborhoods, right? And so this idea of an urbanization of capital um, in terms of what uh, David Harvey has talked about uh, as a geographical movement in time, uh, for example, you know, again, in the context of the U.S. that I, I can talk about in, in the past, since the end of World War II with this increasing suburb, suburbanization in which, again, that was connected with race, um, with uh, many cities such as Los Angeles and New York in which uh, the emerging, again, quote-unquote, middle-class whites fled the city 
um, uh, because uh, they did not want to live side by side by other people from different racialized backgrounds. And so they fled into these all white suburbs and then these sub suburbs themselves became uh, uh, almost demarcated. In other words, if, if you were did not belong, you know, quote unquote belong, live in that suburb. And if you were seen in that suburb, that area by the police, you were stopped, okay? But also, uh, also in addition is, it, because of these suburbs, it, it increased the commodity sales of automobiles, right? So there was no public transportation in the context of the U.S. There was very little tr public transportation in the suburbs, okay? And so people needed to get a car to get to work and to get around, okay? Um, so this idea of capitalism um, uh, where, again, has to urbanize to uh, reproduce itself, as David Harvey writes. Now, um, this is uh, part of the gentrification process, which is indexed by these evolving linguistic landscapes. And so this idea of a reading of a space where um, this has been part of my ethnographic uh, research where in um, the past several years when I was in uh, several cities, um, this photo, as you can see, is um, Summerstown, which was the neighborhood in London in which uh, Charles Dickens spent part of his childhood. Uh, Dickens, who wrote, of course, many great novels, including Hard Times, about a wealthy manufacturer Mr., uh, named Mr. Bounderby. Um, uh, and Dickens, uh, when he was 12 years old, uh, had to go work in a factory because his father um, uh, was out of a job, and so uh, Dickens had to um, help, you know, support himself uh, and feed himself. So he had to, he was a child laborer, and the factory was in this in this neighborhood called Summerstown. So I took a photo of this particular alleyway in Summerstown because it, it is this um, uh, kind of signifies in terms of just the semiotics of the landscape, uh, uh, kind of hearkening back to the past of when it was a very poor neighborhood. However, again, with the gentrification, and it's not just only linguistic signs, of course, um, but other signs as well in terms of how that has evolved. This is in the uh, neighboring um, uh, area of Summerstown called Camden Town, um, uh, in, in which um, here, as you can see, uh, this building is for sale. And the, the street art, the street art, the graffiti here has called to the attention of the ongoing evictions that gentrification involves, rampant across cities around the world. Okay. Um, now, also on the other side of Summerstown is this area, which has now been transformed into this very kind of uh, posh, as the British would say, uh, very affluent. Um, shopping area and uh, this was, it seemed to be, okay, um, the headquarters of a call office company, uh, judging just from the signs and from the architecture. And then it was interesting how this was appropriated uh, by this very um, upscale restaurant. Uh, so this is not actually a call office, it's just the name of a very upscale restaurant which I just passed. I didn't even bother to look at the menu because I was like, okay, I'm not going to pay all that money for that food. Um, and so I took a photo of that as well. Um, this is from the uh, my neighborhood in Los Angeles. And as you can see that uh, on the left-hand uh, side of the photograph was a car wash that's been there ever since I moved into that neighborhood in the late 1980s. It's the neighborhood um, bordering Echo Park uh, in Los Angeles. And to the right uh, was this uh, structure that is, was recently built in the past few years. And here's a close-up of it. And so this is an example of what um, Trinch and Snyder wrote in their uh, article in the Journal of Social Linguistics, a distinction-making signs in which they did a uh, linguistic um, landscape ethnography in, in Brooklyn of the gentrifying neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And so I drew on that idea of distinction making signs because you can see at the bottom on the on the um, the signs on this very you know uh, affluent looking type architecture was okay Pilates Samarasa yoga okay um, and uh, as I had mentioned this before to my students 
uh, I knew what Pilates was and yoga, but I had no idea what Samarasa was. I was like, okay, I actually had to Google it, Google it and find out what that was because like, okay, I have no idea what that is. Uh, and that was, the, you know, it's interesting because there was, I think there's an example of a distinction um, making sign here. This is on that side of, this, of that same building, as you can see. Um, now, it's right across the street from what I just showed you. Um, this uh, small shopping area has been uh, there, uh, again, ever since I moved in that neighborhood in the late 1980s. Uh, and this is what Trinchin Snodger called the old school vernacular signage, uh, as you can see. And, and it's not just the words itself, but as you can see, the fonts and the styles uh, of, these, of, the, of these signs in contrast to what we saw of the of the of how um, yoga and samaras and Pilates was represented. All right, and this is also um, old school vernacular signage in the same neighborhood. And again, going back to the distinction making signs, uh, again in the same neighborhood. And as you can see, um, when I had been away from Los Angeles uh, for a bit, and then when I came back, I. Uh, I noticed the store on the right as I was walking past it and I saw the, the store sign, the social type. Uh, I, actually, I was in a car because, as you know, if, if you might know, um, a, a lot of people who can afford to, uh, you know, it's a car driven city. Um, there are some pedestrians, but uh, anyway, so I, I, the first time I noticed it, I was in a car and I was like, social type, what is that? I thought it was a nightclub or some kind of, you know, um, community center uh, and then when I actually a few days later when I walked past it I looked I looked inside from the windows and it was um, selling uh, uh, calendars and appointment books and I was like okay very interesting it's a stationary store and they have a very fancy title for that the social type which in my I would argue this is a, one of the, just of the many indexicalities of gentrification in terms of uh, these signs where uh, it takes one to know one, right? If, you, if you're not in the know, then you wouldn't go to that store. Here is in the neighborhood of uh, Jamaica Plain uh, here in Boston. Um, and the first time I, Jamaica Plain was, uh, was uh, a working class, uh, predominantly um, a, a community predominantly of color, uh, predominantly uh, black and Latino. Uh, and in the past 10 years or so, I've been told by the locals that it has been very gentrified. And so when I was exploring Jamaica Plain, I came upon this sign. Uh, and again, I also had the same kind of reaction of like, okay, meat land? What, what is that? And then when I, I got closer and I looked in the window, I saw it was a butcher shop. And I was like, okay, very interesting. Um, now it's meat land. And I would say in terms of how this... Um, New word, I had never heard of that word. I don't know if any of you have heard this word, but this word itself, where it signifies a certain kind of, uh, on multiple levels, a certain kind of perhaps appeal to hip, hipness of the gentrifiers of like, well, we won't call it a butcher shop because the word butcher has those violent, sinister implications of killing animals, right? Literally, you know, butchering them up to eat. So we'll just call it Meatland instead to kind of alleviate alleviate some of this um, liberal guilt, as it were, okay? In this other neighborhood uh, near the South End in Boston, um, when I saw this sign, I was also very intrigued, it, you know, when apartments designed for living. I was like, uh, well, uh, what other apartments are designed for, uh, what are they designed for what else other than living, okay? Um, and in the same neighborhood, uh, when I saw this sign, I was like, interesting. Uh, I said, all right, the social semiotics of the color red is usually universally understood as being associated with radicalism, right? Socialism, uh, the word itself, revolution, and then the lofts though, it's like, okay, these multi-million dollar condos, uh, this feeling of somehow, again, being um, cutting edge, as it were. Uh, another example of linguistic landscapes that have been addressed, of course, is this um, graffiti street art, right? And uh, I, I found that very interesting. This was on a subway uh, stop uh, in Boston, 
And uh, when I was looking at the subway car and I saw this, I was like, wow, somebody's actually quoting um, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engel Engels. This is from, of course, um, the ending passage of the Communist uh, Manifesto. So I will just conclude with a quote from the writer um, Ursula Le Guin, where she writes, quote, we live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable, so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change can often begin in art and very often in art, the art of words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. It was really, really interesting. Uh, and now we are going to open for questions. We already have some questions here. Okay. I'm going to... Go dark here. Yes, okay. Okay, so you are back. So thank you very much. It's so many things to, to think about it. But let me try to... to show you the question I can read at the same time. Uh, Professor Osvando, he's a member of Abralitech, he's a founding member and our vice president, he's asking, how imbricated do you think hegemony, language teaching and globalization are? Thank you, that's a, that's a really uh, important question. Um, I, I think they're quite imbricated uh, on multiple levels. Um, and, you know, as we well know, the ongoing um, colonial legacy of English language, in the context again in the U.S., but also around the world, the context of the of uh, in terms of English language teaching, the ongoing uh, colonial legacies of that, the um, the attribution to the hegemony of the so-called native speaker, which has been associated with white people, right? The idea of how uh, uh, English, of course, has been involved with the, the global capital spread uh, in terms of the U.S. economy and the British, the British economy before and then the U.S. economy as well. This idea of language as a capital, right, in terms of the Bordeaux sense, but a certain form of English, only a certain form of English that is, again, the middle class, this, this idea of a middle class educated, standardized American uh, white English as, as being the only commodity, uh, commodity worth selling and, and buying, as it were. Uh, but but also, also with that is in terms of also the curriculum, and this is part of what I have addressed as well in my own work in Power and Meaning Making, uh, the book Power and Meaning Making in an AP classroom, with representations of society uh, that I, in my own experience, uh, that when I taught English um, as an additional language for many years in Los Angeles, and then my ethnographic observations of the curriculum in which these dominant representations of society in these textbooks help perpetuate the hegemony of our uh, economic and social relations, keeping it in place uh, in terms of this idea of like aspirational so forth for our students. So these are all very interconnected. And uh, one more thing I'll just add is the ways in which sometimes, not always, but sometimes teachers themselves may inadvertently uh, perpetuate such hegemonic discourses uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is of course pressure from the higher ups, they don't want to discuss anything controversial in class, uh, but it's also contributing to, you know, uh, I would say, to that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I even, uh, it's on the screen another co commentary that he has made about uh, English language teaching. Um, there is also another commentary here Lots of congratulations on your talk, great talk. Uh, but then, just one moment, please, I'm still. Okay, some comments like, it is very uh, important topic to take into consideration during this hard moment for education and, and for <laughs> every aspect, every political, uh, I'm talking about 
uh, small p that, that we have nowadays, you start talking about the science, and then we have in a hot debate on vaccine here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So uh, th this kind of things, it really scares me. We are on the 21st century and people are still with this idea they should not take vaccine that some, some uh, people, uh, and I'm talking about uh, well-educated people. I'm talking about people who went to college people who has traveled abroad, which in Brazil, it's uh, something very valuable, people who read, and then we get some messages saying, no, it's going to change your gender. It's going to change your sex if you take this vaccine. It's going to turn into a communist or something like this. And then it really scares me. How can a, a well-educated people read something, believe to the point of spreading the world I know that we are contradictory beings, and I know, but it really scares me. Uh, I don't know uh, your feelings about it, but anyway, I would like to hear you about how this, this contradictory information and this identity, I'm not a communist. It seems to be more important than to be protected, to have your family protected, and to recognize what scientists are talking about uh, COVID-19. Sure, sure. You know, I, I, I would, um, I'm not the only one who would be attributing this to, but I would say that uh, some of it is, uh, some, a lot of it has been perhaps driven by social media. A lot of um, uh, <laughs> false, um, uh, false notions and, uh, uh, you know, not facts have just been spread on social media. Um, I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, uh, I, I, can, I can only talk about it in the context of the U.S., but uh, it's interesting on the ways in which science has been taught in the U.S. for the past several decades. I mean, I, I don't know if you know, but in the con in, in some areas in the United States, some, some parts of the United States, there are, uh, is a debate in the school curriculum over whether or not they should teach evolution. Some some states actually say, you know, uh, we should teach it side by side by creationism. So I, I'm obviously, I'm not going to get into a religious debate here, but it's int interesting on how and why that some uh, some uh, science has been jettisoned in favor of other um, frameworks, as it were. Okay. Uh, and I and again, I think this part of it has been exacerbated by social media, in which uh, you know, as we know, we see all these you know various conspiracy theories and so forth, um, perpetuate certain uh, um, misguided ideas. I'll put it very diplomatically. Um, and again, not drawing on the actual science, um, and that's also you know in. I think extremely important, as we well know, where why some people have rejected that climate change is a real thing, right? And um, they'll just say, oh, it's just the weather or weather's always been like that. And again, disregarding the quite obviously rigorous studies done by trained scientists that have proven that our climate is indeed changing rapidly. Thank you very much. I guess we have another, there is a compliment here and we have another question. Uh, this is from Massio Pantoja. Uh, and he, he asks about how, how about your perception on language, on ordinary sense? I, I think that's a, a very interesting and important question as well. You know, it's, it's um, you know, in some ways that we may uh, take uh, uh, language that is presented in ordinary scenes sometimes as a given or take it for granted, in other words. Um, okay, I would say, for example, I will give you the example, uh, again, in the context of the U.S., where there's been uh, a movement to um, go beyond the gender binary with restrooms, right? So traditionally in the in the US with restrooms, it was always labeled, you know, men and then women, right? Um, 
I, I have seen now, uh, at least in the cities like in New York and Boston and Los Angeles, where the signs have now been replaced. Sometimes they'll just go with like M, standing for M, or W for women, okay. Or sometimes they'll go with that um, that universal sign, of, which I, I think goes back to the Greek, right? The signs of the... Um, the symbols for like, okay, this uh, connotes a masculine identity versus, you know, female identity and so forth. But it's also interesting, I didn't show it in the slide, but uh, I, I, I talked th about this with my students uh, about a year ago uh, when I was in the, the Log Logan Airport in Boston at Terminal 2. Um, I saw these images, these uh, for the restroom and the, the images were like a silhouette, silhouettes of what appeared to be cisgender female, cisgender male. Okay, there was no written language, but the the language, the visual language, okay, seemed to like saying, okay, the silhouette of this male, right? But was interesting the way it, my reading, my interpretation of it uh, was was that um, it was not only um, racialized because the silhouette seemed to suggest a, a white male and a white female, but it was also a, a highly uh, uh, gendered and classed because the, the what appealed, uh, appeared to be the female figure was wearing what seemed to be very expensive clothes, uh, very elaborate hair, hair hairstyle, and then the male was seemed to be wearing like you know this nice suit, what have you. I was like, okay. And as one of my friends, um, when I showed the photograph to one of my friends, said um, they didn't fit either sil silhouette, so they were just. Um, Avoid it altogether. So, so yeah. Let me see. Yeah, and that's interesting because we can see the sort of things. Uh, for example, we go to a pizza parlor, a, fa a fancy pizza parlor, and the description is pretty much the same here in Porto Alegre, in Brazil. Okay, so the guys wearing. Uh, a tuxedo and the lady is wearing something very traditional and the guy has a hat. So this kind of things, they, they, they kind of repeat itself along the way. Um, there is another question here from Maria Paula Brock. Uh, I guess she's a member from Abrali Tech, if I'm not mistaken. How could we help our high school students perceive language around them? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I would say that, you know, one of the things we, you know, we should be doing with uh, high school students in terms of the language is to have them think about how they use their language uh, in their everyday lives with, um, you know, family members, with their classmates, with their friends, uh, the people in their neighborhood, and to really kind of have them become more self-reflexive about the, their use of language and what that actually means to them. And so, you know, one of the things that we ask the students would be to thinking about, for example, uh, you know, how they identify, right? And so what would be the particular words they would identify uh, to, to use these words to identify as, right? And then thinking about how certain words have come to become very uh, domineering, dominant, oppressing, right? And how, why certain words are no longer used. Um, how we might think about, um, of course, again, in the context of the US, but in many other countries, how racist terms have emerged and how and why children pick up those racist terms, right? Um, uh, how, is that, how is that spread? Is it through family members and so forth? And have the students think about those use of terms. And this is something that I wrote about um, recently in, a, in the Journal of Language, Culture, and Society when my family, when I was eight years old, we moved out of New York City to the suburb on Long Island. And my first day at the new school on the suburb of Long Island, uh, it was the first time I heard the word chink. And so all these uh, classmates started coming up, on, uh, coming up to me on the playground and started calling me, you know, chinky, you know, slanty eyes, dirty knees, go back to China. And I had never heard the word chink before. And it was interesting uh, and this is way before social media. And so maybe, I don't know where, I don't think it was actually broadcast on American TV back then. So it's interesting because I was the first, as far as I know, I was the first Asian American um, 
in that uh, community, uh, especially in my, in my grade, third grade, uh, there were no other Asian American students. So I was like, where did they get the word ching from? They must have learned it from somewhere, right? Either their parents or what have you, because again, it, there was no social media. And I don't know, maybe it was a move from a movie. I don't know. Um, but I think that would be one of the ways in which, you know, if, where if, you know, to actually ask, okay, why are you using this word? What does this word mean to you? Um, how is this used? And so forth. And that just applies not only to race, but of course, uh, um, gender terms as well as we know, um, terms in, of um, uh, homophobic terms and, and so on and so forth, where children are using all these words or, or in, in terms of oppressing. So I would say, you know, really having a conversation and having them to become self-reflexive and critical of the particular words they have and asking them themselves how words have hurt them uh, in turn, that, you know, they may use other words to hurt other people, but ask them, well, what are the particular words that have hurt you and why have they hurt you? And have you thought about when you use some other words, how the ways in which it has hurt others. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, we have another question from uh, Leslie M. Muliko. He is a member of Abralitec, and he was very excited with your presentation. So how do you see the role of the English language in the university internationalization programs? a way to spread language hegemony and capitalist values. Do you see this uh, English uh, using as in internationalization programs as a way to spread language hegemony and capitalism, uh, capitalist values? Well, I would say with the, the first part, it is definitely uh, spread, uh, spreading the hegemony of English language, yes, uh, around the world in terms of how uh, English language has become, you know, the dominant language, um, the language that um, people feel that they have to uh, aspire to learn and so forth. In terms of capitalist values, um, that is not uh, as clear because, again, it would be depending on not only the curriculum materials that are being used and what, what are the representations of society that are in those curriculum materials um, that are geared toward English language uh, learning, but also importantly, how instructors themselves, uh, along with their students, would take up particular representations of those um, social and economic uh, relations. And I think it's, you know, it's interesting where, you know, and this is not just with English language teaching, this is obviously with education, broadly speaking, right? And where we, we always would confront particular representations in our curriculum and how it would uh, attempt to mirror uh, societal aspects to us. So I think, you know, I, I think the, this idea of spreading capitalist values is, is not uh, straightforward. Um, and it's also interesting, again, within the discourse of uh, a multicultural uh, uh, liberalism slash identity politics in which where they'll, they'll show, you know, increasing diversity uh, 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 um, in textbook representations. However, the economic and social relations are still intact. Well, okay, so if you have, uh, you know, more people visually represented, but... Um, they're still um, in a hierarchical order. Well, nothing's really changed much, has it? Okay, thank you once again. We still have a question um, here. Hopefully I will pronounce your name something similar. I'm terrible, sorry, terrible, sorry. Shu Wen. Uh, Liu, Liu, uh, probably I got it this part, uh, uh, close to right. I'm, I'm sorry for not knowing how to pronounce your name. How to balance being liberal and the political correctness that liberalists have a tendency to fall to? Well, you know, it's interesting, the term uh, political correctness, uh, and this is something that I discuss in one of my classes at UMass Boston, uh, how that term has been appropriated by the right. Uh, 
So uh, I'm sure many of you know, but the term political correctness actually stemmed uh, from the 1950s in the context of the Soviet Union in which um, in the, you know, uh, as they were trying to get out of the Stalinist era, but there was still obviously the Stalinist legacy. But this idea of a political correctness was somehow that you were adhering to the party line, right? Uh, that you were not a covert um, capitalist, uh, okay? And then that term was taken up by uh, the new left in the 1960s in terms of, uh, of being progressive on many fronts. However, starting in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, again, with the rise of neoliberalism and Ronald Reagan, uh, the right um, appropriated that term to turn it around and saying, oh, well, you know, we can no longer uh, call people, uh, you know, with racial epithets. We can never, no longer use the N word. We have to use these words. We have to use these words. Oh, do we have to speak in a language that's quote unquote, politically correct. In other words, that they were being censored and that it was uh, somehow un-American because it was going against their freedom of speech, uh, which was uh, not only in my opinion, but many other people's opinions, a misreading of the First Amendment in the United States of freedom of speech does not mean the freedom to enact violence. And that is obviously, as we well know, the violence of, of race, um, racist words. Um, and so this idea of political correctness has been, um, since it's been appropriated by uh, the right, um, this idea of going beyond of what political correctness is, is I think this um, important to, to stress to people, again, going back to the previous question about how to teach high school students would be to, again, and this is just for the, uh, also for the broader public, where, you know, in their own experiences, have they ever, again, have they ever been felt hurt, uh, wounded by a particular word? And we all have, right, in, in, in many different contexts. So again, drawing attention to the broader public, the power of language and how language has always uh, been a tool, right, uh, by the powers that be to enact violence and oppress those, right, who uh, will resist with their own language. And I think this is important to raise this meta-linguistic awareness amongst the public, again, going, because I, I don't know in the context of Brazil, forgive me, but in the, in the US, linguistics is not, is not taught at all, and definitely not taught in high school, as far as I know. Um, and uh, many colleges, some universities, but obviously, but many colleges also really don't have linguistic programs. So what I'm saying is that a lot of the, you know, people are not exposed to the ideas around what, like, what actually constitutes language. I mean, of course, they know how to use it and well, well, of course. But in terms of creating a critical uh, meta awareness around our daily language use and how it impacts each other. Okay, many people thanking you. I'm just them here for such an enlightening um, talk and for having this opportunity of rethinking about our role as um, language teachers, especially English language teachers and also as political beings and for all the things that uh, the language constructor, co-constructor help uh, build. And uh, I think this is an awareness that we do have to, to, to be, do have to have uh, with each other. So uh, I want you to thank you so very much for taking our invitation, for being gentle enough, because when Abralitec, uh, the third uh, Abralitec International uh, Seminar changed dates, then it was on Thanksgiving and you weren't able to come to take part of it, but anyway, you are here with us. So thank you very much. I know how crazy this year have been for everybody. Uh, and you had some, some losses due to, to COVID. So 
thank you very much for taking part of this live for we are we'll keep on on talking and we'll read your articles and books which are very very interesting and hoping for the the ones to come and i would like to thank everybody from abralitech everybody who uh, attended this and this is my last um role as the president of abralitech uh, my term ends right today so it was a great pleasure to close this with such a, a nice uh, talk and thank everybody for all the support and everything that we've been done. Now the next president of Abralitec, Juliana Paula Skinka, she is here, okay. But I, I won't leave uh, completely. I'll still be the vice president of Abralitec. So thank you very much for all. Dr. Chen, Thank you so very much. And everybody have a good night and take care. And I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and I enjoyed it. And thank you everyone for attending. So thank you very much. Thank you.